Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series on the book of Proverbs. And it's a series that we are studying from January to March of 2015. This particular lesson is lesson number seven in that series entitled Dealing with Fights. Now, no human beings fight, do they? Do we ever fight? This is the lesson for February 14 of 2015, and we'll learn more about that. But before we begin, we hope you have your Bible handy, because we're going to be doing a little bit of jumping around in scriptures, but primarily focusing on Proverbs 17 to 19, if you want to get your Bible open there. We would like to begin with by asking you to join us in a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, it's a great privilege to study your word, to have this inspired record to open easily before us in languages that we can understand, to compare one part of the scripture with another part of the scripture so easily, and now to look at the wisdom that was collected and put together and recorded for us by Solomon thousands of years ago. May we learn from that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What are our top priorities? Do we take that seriously? Do we really stop and think, okay, seriously, is my family more important? Is my bank account more important? Is my car more important? Are my kids more important? Think of all the people that, like, apparently the only thing they think about or can think about in, in their lives is worldly fame, power, pleasure, you know, wealth, something like that. There's an ancient Egyptian proverb that says, better is bread with a happy heart than wealth with vexation. You can find that in a book on ancient Egyptian literature written by or, or put together by Miriam Lick Time, The New Kingdom, Volume 2. So what are our priorities? Let's be serious now. What are our priorities? Is having a good relationship with a number of friends and peace within our families more important than having a large bank account? What is the real basis of happiness? Do we know? Well, Proverbs 17 and 19, just to, to, to sort of open up our discussion, look at Proverbs 17, verse 9. If you want people to like you, I'm reading from the Good News Bible, forgive them when they wrong you. Remembering wrongs can break up a friendship. We sometimes call that holding a grudge, right? And look at Proverbs 19.11 by comparison. If you are sensible, you will control your temper. temper. When someone wrongs you, it is a great virtue to ignore it. Hmm. Is that the way we're supposed to deal with problems? Just ignore them? No. Well, yes? No? no? No. Okay, that was a big, long answer. <laughs> That's all it, that's okay. All it so, at what point do we decide, okay, this problem that I've just observed is a foible and I'm going to look over it, or it's serious and I need to do something about it? How do we decide that? We, we certainly don't want to encourage people to go on sinning, do we? Well, maybe it depends on uh, how important it is to you. Something is important okay. to you. Shouldn't you deal with it? What if it, what if it pertains to matters of, matters of truth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, any time someone's living a lie, that's a matter of truth, isn't it? Question about truth? Well, we have some biblical examples of people who ran into problems, and uh, you know, we've got Elijah and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Mount Carmel and. We've got Daniel and the lion's den. Yes. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three Hebrew youths. There's lots of times when uh, people didn't necessarily back away from from things where there were disagreements, especially in regards to things we refer to as as truth. Okay. Well, one of the ways that people, unfortunately, have tended to respond to uh, 
foibles in somebody else is found in Proverbs 18, 8. Gossip is so tasty. How we love to swallow it. <laughs> There's another parallel uh, verse. It's found in Proverbs 26, verse 22. We'll come to chapter 26 a little bit later, but um, that's, I'm going to have to cheat a little bit here. Give me just a second. If I can press the right buttons. Um, you got two instead of 22. Sorry, I can get down to 22 here in just a second. Yeah, gossip is so tasty, how we love to swallow. Just to actually a repeat of the, the previous verse that we were looking at. So what do we do? How do we deal with things like gossip? I once saw a cartoon showing two ladies talking over the back fence. The first one said, have you heard? And she went on to, to tell the juicy tale. And her neighbor responded, uh, I'm sorry, I don't pass along gossip. Whereupon the first lady responded, so you're the bottleneck. <laughs> is, that, is that the way we're supposed to deal with that kind of issue? It's interesting, and this is not in Proverbs, but in Romans 1, verses 28 to 32, gossips are right in the middle of one of the longest lists of evildoers in the entire Bible. That ought to tell us something, right? But what, what is gossip? What's the... I mean, what, isn't there information that needs to be passed along? Okay, so. A, 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 in, in difficult times? Depends on the gravity and whether or not it's slander or something dangerous or, or that kind of thing. Then you've got to do something about but, it. What, we're talking about something of this juicy. What if it's true? <laughs> what if it's true? <laughs> yeah, what about that? Is, does, is truth qualify as gossip sometimes? Well, so Dr. Prabhat used to say you could let one gossip into heaven, mm -hmm. but that would be hell for him because yeah. nobody would listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't the wouldn't the difference between, you know, I th I think sometimes there are difficult circumstances that you see that you may be involved in, um, and you you feel like you need to communicate, but you're hesitant to do this in what would be a very legitimate circumstance, it would seem to me, because you don't want to be a gossip. You, you're torn between um, reporting well, information in a manner that might help to lead to a solution as a problem, simply because you're afraid that you might become, you know, a, a gossip. Wouldn't, wouldn't the difference there be the intent? A gossip it would be the intent is to hurt somebody, whereas... Not necessarily. It might be just a juicy story. <laughs> well, and, and I, I will tell you that as a health professional, I talk to patients every day, and I hear lots of stuff that I don't pass along. Of and, of course, that's... Um, we have a process now we call HIPAA. We're not supposed to be sharing this information with anybody else, but I hear it all the time. I think gossip has to do really with about speaking about uh, regarding someone behind their back yeah. instead of calling someone to task and having a conversation with them. And if you have to do that, I don't think truth asks for that. If I'm speaking the truth, I should be able to. It's, I think it's best to just talk mm -hmm. to the person. Maybe they can fix whatever is wrong or not wrong. But when gossip festers and a lot of lies get miss with the truth if there is truth I try not to take part in it <laughs> yeah um, what do you think about this advice from Proverbs 17 17 friends always show their love what are relatives for if not to share trouble <laughs> is that what you think about your relatives well are there gossips within a family mm -hmm. yeah that's true. Question. Fair yeah. question. I think it comes down to sort of two basic questions. If it's trivial, you can ignore it and go for it. Otherwise, be diplomatic and see if you can turn it in another direction. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, I mean, let's be honest. 
you, this might not be agreed upon by people standing at the marriage altar, but any two people who live together long enough, there's going to be some differences of opinion. And uh, why is that? Well, it's because none of us is perfect. No perfect saints. I'm, I'm not, not here on planet Earth. I know some of you might disagree, but um, probably it's true. <laughs> yeah, we fortunately have two couples with us today. Um, we love our spouses not because they have problems or mistakes or flaws. We love them despite those problems, mistakes, and flaws, or whatever you choose to call them. And we need to recognize when we have a tendency to point out somebody else's flaws that we have a few flaws ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> so true love is not blind. Yeah. Sinning and even making mistakes has consequences for everybody. So the Hebrew word, since we're dealing with the Old Testament here, the Hebrew word for justice, shalom, which means peace, it means a lot of different things, also means righteousness and includes ideas of love and charity. Real compassion means that we put our arms around the sinner, but we expect them to improve. We, the, pur the purpose of putting your arms around a sinner is not, D Jesus didn't say, okay, now you can go out and sin again. What did Jesus say? No more. No more. Go and sin no more. We have to keep the moat out of our own eye before you even look further. Yeah. Why do we have such a hard time uh, correcting our mistakes? Because we're told to mind our own business. <laughs> okay. Um, because if those mistakes were easy to correct, we, we wouldn't have the mistakes. I see. <clears throat> Again, this, this we're studying Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 17.10. An intelligent person learns more from one rebuke than a fool learns from being beaten a hundred times. What does that tell us? I think there's a truth in that. <laughs> the RSV says a rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. Yes. Um, here's another version of that, Proverbs 19.25. Arrogance should be punished so that people who don't know any better can learn a lesson. If you're wise, you will learn when you are corrected. Is that true? Well, <clears throat> depends on whether my wife is correcting me or not. I see. <laughs> not if you're correcting your wife, but if she's correcting you, right? <laughs> well, I, I don't think any of us would argue with the fact that the best example to follow would be Jesus' example. And it's very interesting that in the book Desire of Ages, in the early chapters, when he's still a young person, it says, even for to observe someone doing wrong was painful to him. Even to see somebody else doing something wrong was painful to him. Well, and those really probably didn't end up with, at least with names in his parables, did they? I'm sorry to say, who Th did? Those observations oh, yeah. did not end up in Jesus' parables uh, yeah. with the names attached to them. No, they didn't. <clears throat> no. Well, the the most obvious and the most widely known story about Jesus dealing with a flagrant sinner is probably the story of the Jesus dealing with the woman taken at adultery. We, that's what we usually sort of call it. And that's found in John 8, verses 1 to 11. Ellen White has some very interesting words to say about that parable or that, that experience. When Jesus forgave her, she expected to die from stoning right there on the spot. She was sure that all these saints that would, had trapped her were, you know, and so when Jesus started pointing out their sins and they started disappearing one by one, she couldn't believe it. You know, you can imagine she's, you know, what would you do if you were about expecting people to throw stones at you, you know? Well, when Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more, this was to her, the, now I'm quoting from Ellen White, this was to her the beginning of a new life, a life of purity and peace, devoted to the service of God. Now imagine, here's a one incident 
This woman has been presumably a prostitute or something like that for some period of time, or at least has been seduced into it at one time or another. And now this one encounter with Jesus, and bang, she's a new person. In the uplifting of this fallen soul, Jesus performed a greater miracle than in healing the most grievous physical disease. This is better than cleansing from leprosy. He cured the spiritual malady which is unto death everlasting. This penitent woman became one of his most steadfast followers. With self-sacrificing love and devotion, she repaid his forgiving mercy. And I think most of us probably heard at one time or another, there are, there are many people who believe that, on the basis of that comment, that this was actually Mary Magdalene. We don't know that for sure. In his act of pardoning this woman and encouraging her to live a better life, the character of Jesus shines forth in the beauty um, of perfect righteousness. While he does not palliate sin, nor lessen the sense of guilt, he seeks not to condemn, but to save. The world had for this erring woman only contempt and scorn, but Jesus speaks words of comfort and hope. The sinless one pities the weakness of the sinner and reaches to her a helping hand. While the hypocritical Pharisees denounce, Jesus bids her go and sin no more. Is our of Ages 462, paragraphs 2 and 3. Can we, uh, can we afford to do that kind of stuff in our day? What kind of stuff? For <laughs> Forgive those kind of uh -oh. blatant sinners. I'm trying to figure out a contemporary situation in which this might be played out. In this case, um, there was a particular conflict Mm -hmm. here with Jesus and the Pharisees but on the other on the other on the other hand he was kind of a third party mm -hmm. between a dispute between two people I'm trying to think of a of a situation in which maybe you or I might be in a similar circumstance where we would be the where we would be the third party and we could take the tack that he took um but I can't think of one right off the bat. Well, let me take you, give you an example. I have two fairly close friends, young women that I have worked with some, sometime in the past, not currently. Both of them had experiences where, and I'm not going to go into the details, I want you to try to trace anybody's story here, but got into affairs, or either they or their husband got into affairs, and caused all kinds of havoc in their marriages. So what do you do? I had a similar situation with two friends. Um, one was doing that kind of behavior, and then the other friend was always trying to counsel her, as we all were, that she shouldn't be doing that, and she decided to just end that, the, the other friend decided to end the relationship and just walked away. And mm -hmm. I've tried to be her friend, because I think that's the right thing to do, to keep counseling her to mm -hmm. change but I don't know if I'm lesser because I stick around than yeah. the girl who knew to walk away. Yeah. It's a challenge. I mean, in one case, this, this young lady is being just treated something awful by her still officially husband, but, uh, and this guy's carrying on with another woman, and the other woman has already had a baby as a result of this experience, and I mean, what do you do? Say, that's fine, it's okay, just carry on? How, how, it seems to me, um, I think most of us have read instances of where there's been a murder. Somebody's murdered somebody's child or wife or husband, and then out of that has grown jail ministries here and there. Now, mm -hmm. that to me is the ultimate. Yeah, that would be a, a wonderful experience out of something that turned out really bad. Given the person that did the deed, yeah. that even got them around to thinking about all that. I mean, that, that's... Well, the, maybe the classic example of this, it's an old story now, is the story of Harry Orchard. Yes, yes. Yeah. Definitely. Killed a governor in Idaho and was in, in jail and then the governor's wife started ministering to him and other people tried to minister to him and 
there he was, life sentence, and he became a great Christian example and, and uh, so forth in the jail. Yeah. Is, there, is there a parallel story, the story of um, at, at Simon's house, mm -hmm. when Mary comes and kind of complains about, uh, I mean Martha comes and kind of complains about Mary and Jesus is in the middle here. Is there a, a similar um, um, pattern of, of approach on Jesus' part here with, with this in a, in a way, a way he ameliorates this? Or Here well, we have two sisters. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly not nearly the, the dramatic and, and death-defying situation. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Well, Proverbs 18, one of the next chapters we need to talk about because we could spend a lot of time on this subject we've looked at in Proverbs 17, but we have some more chapters to talk about. Proverbs 18 focuses a lot on the use of words and all of that implies and how you can do wonderful things with words and you can do awful things with words. Um, unfortunately, it's often true that fools speak before they think. It's better to think first, probably. Does it's, that make most of us fools? <laughs> I wasn't because trying to be quite speak, so personal. Because we speak before we think, <laughs> or at least it's, before considering all the implications. It's just, it's an interesting coincidence that in the English language, the words listen and silent are spelled with the same letters. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't mean, I don't know if that, that was intentional or not, but... Uh, it, it's very interesting. 18.8 here. The words of a whisper are like delicious morsels. Yes. They go down into the inner parts of the body. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Perhaps. Okay. Look at Proverbs 18.4. A person's words can be a source of wisdom. Deep as the ocean, fresh as a flowing stream. Now that would be good words, right? Um, what makes some words, or why are some words or some expressions, some ideas considered to be wise and others considered to be foolish? And, you know, we talk about, we, we know that the characteristic of water, if you, if you watch streams, if you like, like watching rivers and so forth, at the places where they run deep, they seem to be moving slower. And they're, they're narrower, and they, they don't seem to be doing a lot. And the places where they're, they're fairly shallow and they're running over the rocks and so forth, they look, they look you know, dangerous and all that kind of stuff. Does that tell us anything about human behavior? Proverbs here is talking about deep waters running quietly. Um, do we always think about the consequences of our words before we speak them? No. <laughs> Are you trying to speak out of experience or what? Yes, <coughs> yes. Not only that, it's the delivery too. Yeah. Yeah, the way you say things. Because I've said things and then later thought, oh my God, Yoli, why did you say that? <laughs> well, look at Proverbs 18. Now we're looking at Proverbs 18. Look at verses 20 and 21. I'm, I'm reading from the Good News Bible here again. You will have to live with the consequences of everything you say. My wife reminds me every once in a while of something I said a long time ago. <laughs> What you say can preserve life or destroy it. So you must accept the consequences of your words. So what's wrong with that? Is that saying never speak up or? I hope not. Well, but, but it's an old and but very true adage that there are always two sides to every story. At least two sides. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's more than two sides. Um, Look at a couple more verses. Proverbs 18, verse 2. A fool does not care whether he understands a thing or, or not. All he wants to do is to show how clever he is. And if you go down to verse 17, it says, The first to speak in court always seems right until his opponent begins to question him. You know, I don't know how many of you had ex very much experiences in courts, but it's very much like that. You know, you hear one side, well, man, oh, yeah, obviously, this, yeah. Oh, my, but. Sorry, my question is on 18.7, a fool's mouth is his undoing. 
Yeah. <laughs> Why does it seem that politicians, media people, they all have a following when yeah. they say foolish things? Good question. Masses are, have a short memory. And they want to hear what they want to hear, and they're not concerned about truth, really. They're, they like promises, empty promises. Yeah. yeah. It's human nature. Fools, would it be fair to, con to define a fool as someone with a closed mind and an open mouth? <laughs> <I like it. laughs> a deadly combination, right? Certainly the start of it. <laughs> well, the wise people are those who are willing to listen to other people's opinions and consider them carefully before responding. Only God doesn't need a second opinion. Um, is, is it hard to develop that kind of a character, is, trait? To listen before we jump into conclusions? I think it's especially hard with those that are the closest to you. I see. Who are you referring to? <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends a little on personalities, too. Yeah. You know, we've been studying or reading about gossips, which is many times maybe things that are not true. Uh -huh. And yet somebody, that those, those stories keep being perpetuated. How about God? Mm -hmm. Hasn't he been a victim and to, yeah. to the detriment of everybody or the majority mm -hmm. because of the false? And people go to the mat for a false concept of God. I mean, wouldn't... It, weren't the, the, the words of Satan in heaven basically gossip? Yeah. yeah. That's well, how the great said. controversy got started. Yeah. yeah. Of course, God could speak up more frequently. But, uh, <laughs> he doesn't want to overpower us. <laughs> but, um, oh, I have another. Why, I, I often right. think about why, you know, and I think people expect that. I think, I think people expect God to come down and do miracles for them or... Or those of us of our faith, sometimes we think, why doesn't God come down and, 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 but you know, he's things straight, right? That's right. But you know, he has been down here before. He's done some dramatic things. I mean, the flood was a pretty dramatic thing. And what about you know, Mount Sinai? Yeah. And, and people, you know, people are still laughing about Noah. Most yeah. of the, a good share of the cartoons in this world, they've got old Noah on the boat there and he's still a laughing stock. So, yeah. you know, uh, if if we don't pay any attention, why why would God feel that it's going to do any good to, to come down here and? Well, and I have a more serious, even maybe more serious than that. Serious as that is, a more serious question about that issue. If God says, I mean, I've asked people, okay, how would you like to have maybe ten minutes every week? And you know, this ten minutes is just for you. God is going to come up and come down and appear in person, and you've got ten minutes with him every week. Sound like a good idea? Okay, what would you think if the, the devil demanded equal time? Mm. No? <laughs> You're not too excited about that possibly? Don't you think the devil would demand equal time? Sure he would. Well, you know, when we have this book here, mm -hmm. and yeah. we've got, it's all right here, mm -hmm. so that's why it's why, safer why, to have it in that form. You know, why, why, do we, why do we sometimes feel that we need something else when there is so much? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not such an overpowering presence of God when it's written in front of us instead of Him face to face with us. Yeah. Well, maybe that's, maybe that's what we're for. Maybe we're supposed to, you know, maybe humans, maybe the good people are supposed to be a little better than they are. Maybe they're supposed to now, be. there's a thought. <laughs> That's what God has to use is people. Maybe, maybe we're the instruments here. And course, I don't know where I fit in there. But Have you ever been absolutely certain about something only to find out later you were wrong? Oh, yes. Never. <laughs> <laughs> You've all probably heard the joke about the guy said, yeah, I, 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 I made a mistake once before. I remember back in 1935, I, <laughs> you know, that kind of nonsense. But well, what does it teach us about judging others prematurely? Here's a story that was included in our Bible study guide that's an interesting one. A king needed to appoint a new minister to the highest office of his kingdom. For this purpose, he organized a special contest on lying. Who could utter the biggest lie? You know, I don't know if people would even be aware of such things, but there are, there are actually contests every year to see who can tell the people, 
you know, I think they even get into Guinness World and Book of World Records. Who can tell the biggest lie, the farthest out lie? So here this guy is having a contest in lying. All his ministers applied, and each one came and spoke their biggest lie. But the king was not satisfied. Their lies seemed lame. The king then asked his closest and most trusted counselor, Why didn't you apply? The counselor answered, I am sorry to disappoint you, Majesty, but I cannot apply. Why not? asked the king. Because I never lie, the counselor replied. And guess who got the position? <laughs> Yeah, as sinners, lying comes to us easier than we think. For this reason, again, how careful we need to be with our words. Well, if you've, if you've had a chance to look at some of the Proverbs recently, and I certainly hope you have, you've noticed that there are certain ideas that get repeated fairly, frequent, fairly often. And here are some examples. In these three chapters, 17, 18, and 19, um, look at these comments about lies. 17.4, evil people listen to evil ideas and liars listen to lies. Does that mean that uh, liars like lies? Well, 17 verse 7, respected people do not tell lies and fools have nothing worthwhile to say. 17.19, it is better to be poor but honest than to be a lying fool. 19.22, it is a disgrace to be greedy. Poor people are better off than liars. Does that imply that if you lie, if you're a really good job at lying, you can make money? 19 verse um, 5, if you tell lies in court, you will be punished. There will be no escape. And 19 verse 9, no one who tells lies in court can escape punishment. He is doomed. And I should just say in, in passing here that if you would be interested in getting our handouts that are available, Online, you can go to theox.org, that's T H E O X.org, and you can look at the materials that we prepare for these presentations. You know, these, these aphorisms, these statements are, what, about 3,000 years old or more? Yeah. But nowadays, what you just said, those are politicians, there is no punishment for them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know they, they just keep on perpetuating themselves. They've got the system tied up. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's got to be one or two in there that hope springs eternal, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, lying is a terrible trait. What do we gain by doing it? It may seem to provide a temporary escape from condemnation or consequences, but it virtually never works out in the end. The Bible speaks repeatedly about how we should deal with the poor among us. It's another example. What is the end? The time when you when someone discovers that you've been lying to them. Well, yeah, but there are there are people that live out their lives to the end of their lives, and nobody discovers till after they're gone. That's the end, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the Bible speaks repeatedly about how we should deal with the poor among us. This applies especially to widows and orphans. And there's quite a bit about it in Deuteronomy 24, verses 10 to 22, which we don't have time to look at today. But consider in these, again, chapters 17 to 19 of Proverbs, some comments about dealing with wealth and poor, poverty. If you laugh at poor people, this is 17, verse 5, if you laugh at poor people, you insult the God who made them. You will be punished if you take pleasure in someone's misfortune. Rich people are always finding new friends, but the poor cannot keep the few they have. Has that been your experience? Rich people, however, imagine that their wealth protects them like high, strong walls around a city. Is that true? Rich people can do some pretty foolish things and it pretty much seems like they get away with it, don't they? The RSV adds to it uh, that um, walls is this in his imagination. <laughs> his imagination, okay. 18 verse 23, when the poor speak, they have to beg politely. But when the rich answer, they are rude. Which would you rather be? It is better to be poor but honest than to be a lying fool. 19 verse 1. 19 verse 4, rich people are always finding new friends, but the poor cannot keep the few they have. It's a repetition of what we read earlier. 19 verse 7, even the relatives of a poor person have no use for him. 
No wonder he has no friends. No matter how hard he tries, he cannot win any. Is that really true? This no, that sorry. This implies that friends are bought. <laughs> yeah, it almost yeah. does, isn't it? Well, maybe, maybe it's saying just the opposite. Maybe it's saying that poor people are poor because of, of their attitudes. Mm -hmm. It's a possibility. It, it kind of, to me, it, it, there's a, almost a parallel when you open the paper and find out that the law has cleaned out where all the uh, street people live. Mm -hmm. And I mean, down the back by the creek or something. Yeah. I mean, it's almost that to a T. Yeah. Well, 19 verse 10 says, The Lord is like a strong tower. Now the, now, the rich think they have these imaginary walls, but here it says, The Lord is like a strong tower where the righteous can go and be safe. Rich people, however, imagine that their wealth protects them like high, strong walls around the city, almost like the previous verse that we read. So there's Not, no, no righteous rich people? Of course. Well, let's well, hope that the righteous poor, are... Poor old Abraham. Poor old... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. You know, he seemed to be... He had an army of 318 people working for him. Yeah, he didn't have to be afraid of anything. 19 verse 22, it is a disgrace to be greedy. Poor people are better off than liars. That's a repetition of something we more or less read earlier. Well, Probably people. written by a poor person. <laughs> <laughs> poor people are going to inherit the earth, so. Yeah, I thought verse 17 was interesting. I, I never really looked at it like that until I read this. Yeah. This seems a funny thing for Solomon to be writing. Mm. Why is he writing something off like this? I think I skipped. Did I skip number 17? Yeah, but it's got a... a 19 verse 17. When you give to the poor, it is like lending to the Lord, and the Lord will pay you back. Does that remind you of anything in the New Testament? Remember Matthew... Matthew 25, starting with verse 31, I think to 46 or something like that. Which young ruler would probably come into there, that in the long run? Yeah. I was thinking about the place he says, when, when the judgment day comes, they'll separate the sheep from the goats. And yeah. he says, you people on my right hand, what, what did you do? You fed the poor. You went yes. visited the people in prison. You gave clothes to people, etc. Well, no, we didn't do that. Oh, yes, you did. As you were doing it for the poor, it was like doing it for me. That's what Mother Teresa lived by that. Yeah. Whatsoever you do unto the list of yeah. you do unto me. Yeah. My, my brother had a very interesting experience some years ago before she passed away while the, her, her thing there in, in Calcutta was going full speed. He took a group of students from the university here over there to spend some, they were doing several things, but one of the things they did, they spent like two days there with her doing, you know, in her places and taking care of patients and feeding the poor people who couldn't feed themselves and so forth. It was, it, was, it was a very incredible experience. Well, talking about the things we've been talking about, Ellen White says in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 195, the spirit of gossip and tail-bearing is one of Satan's special agencies to sow discord and strife, to separate friends and to undermine the faith of many in the truthfulness of our positions. Brethren and sisters are too ready to talk about the faults and errors that they think, they think exist in others, and especially in those who have borne unflinchingly the messages of reproof and warning given them of God. So unfortunately, it's very easy for, if, if you, you, know, you realize that you're not doing everything you should do, and then someone comes along and they're doing obviously a better job and people recognize them for what they're doing instead of saying I'm sorry I'm, I'm falling short let me fix my ways it's a lot easier to criticize a person that's doing the job well he's just a goody goody or he's you know he's just trying to maybe he wants the position as the new pastor or whatever you know well the children going on this is now um, Testimonies of the Church Volume 4 page 195 this will be the next paragraph the children of those, these complainers listen with open ears and receive the poison of disaffection. Parents are thus blindly closing the avenues through which the hearts of the children might be reached. How many families season their daily meals with doubt and questionings? 
They, they dissect the characters of their friends and serve them up as dainty dessert. A precious bit of slander is passed around the board to be commented upon not only by adults, but by children. And this God is dishonored. Jesus said, and here's our verse, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me, Matthew 25, 40. Therefore Christ is slighted and abused by those who slander his servants. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, 195. Now, slander, is that telling... Uh things that are not true, or is it telling Presum things that are true? Presumably slander is telling things that are not true. Probably mixed with a little bit of truth, just to make Usually, almost always, the devil's scheme is to mix in a little bit of truth. Make it palatable, mm -hmm. make it believable, deception. So now, honestly, how do we deal with problems we detect in our families, our friends, our spouses? We pretend well, like they never happened? There are no problems in my spouse. I see. Well, good answer. Yeah. <laughs> I well, would uh, say that you, you cannot do anything for that person without the help of God. Mm -hmm. okay. you, you have to take it to Him to help with direction that you go. So you're not going to speak at the first opportunity. Mm hmm. If you pretend, if you know something that somebody has done that was bad, and you pretend like it never happened, are you encouraging them to continue that bad behavior? Could be. Again, it's the gravity of the situation. A little kid does something, walks off with the cookie, you're going to teach him something. If you know uh, the church treasurer is pocketing something, that's a whole different deal. <laughs> but that's may, maybe that's the way he learned it. Does God treat us as if we had never done them? Well, I suppose there's two ways to look at that. Obviously, he's willing to welcome us home if we're willing to give up our evil behaviors. Um, but he knows that they have, it has bad consequences, and he points out repeatedly in scriptures that, you know, you, you have to live with your conse the consequences of your behavior. So I guess there's sort of two sides to the answer to that question. Um, one of the problems that plagues our world is divorce. Ma Malachi 2.16 says that God hates divorce. Why do you think that the divorce rate among Christians and even among Seventh-day Adventists is virtually equal to the divorce rate among in the world? Does that is that is that say something about how we go about choosing our partners to begin with? I think I think there's an uh, there's an area for that, and I think our standards have been eroded here and there too. Not so we, only we 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 have to have. Across higher the, standards for the people we marry, no, not no, no, for no, us, no, but no, for the no, people no. we marry. I'm, I'm talking no, across, I'm the board, <laughs> across the board. Across the board, non-believers, and I'm talking Christians generally. I think, even with non-believers, you, you think back 60, 70 years ago, there was less divorce. Now, probably were a lot of folk, particularly women, got abused terribly. It was yeah. never <laughs> out in the open. Yeah. Well, Malachi says that God hates divorce. Wasn't it Ezra that? separated some spouses. Well, and if you go back and look at the Ezra story, what does it tell you? It says, here, are, here were women coming from these surrounding nations. They were marrying Israelite men. And it turns out, and it says this specifically, if you wonder what kind of education their children were getting, it says their children couldn't even speak Hebrew. Or, or Aramaic, for that matter, which is probably the case in, in, in Ezra's day. So what kind of an education are they getting? Are they getting an education from their fathers who speak Aramaic? Or are they getting education primarily from their mothers who are pagans? Pretty clear, right? Yeah. I think that's why Ezra did he. So under those circumstances, divorce is the appropriate well, way to go. If you, were, <clears throat> if you were back before the, the flood, 
where it says the sons of God, which were the descendants of Seth, saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and took the ones they liked. And you saw, if you, if you could see from God's perspective, and you could see the trend of what's, where things are headed, would you say it would be better for them to break up those marriages or continue with them? Or to not have started them. Have the well, place. obviously so not to start them begin would, would, would be started. Better. So the question is, uh, and uh, when you boil it down, is, is a divorce legitimate in some circumstances? Well, I, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, oh and of course, if you say it's legitimate <laughs> in some cases, then where was the problem back at the beginning? <laughs> Isn't like get us in trouble here? We won't be on TV anymore. <laughs> some of the people back in Washington D.C. hear this. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, is it possible? Don't anybody speak about your own experience? Is it better? Is a better indication this whole divorce issue? Is that a real? Is that a better indication of how selfish we tend to be? I think there's certainly room for that. Well, going back to your illustration of uh, of the um, of the of the evil women, the evil wives here. Um, if 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 and this is something confusing to me. We often say back then, well, men, women were nothing but chattel. They didn't have any mm -hmm. control or anything. So if the good person in the marriage had absolute control, then you could solve those problems, maybe. Theoretically. Theoretically. So. Well, the devil had that idea in mind when he tried to kill all the, all the Israelite baby boys in Moses' day, didn't he? Because he, as far as he was concerned, if the girls are forced to marry Egyptian men, what's going to happen? Going to go that way. Do do we ever do we ever lie just as quote a social norm? If you feel terrible and you walk into the office and someone just says to you, "How are you doing today?" Do you say, "Oh, I feel awful," or do you say, "Oh, I'm fine"? You want to break off conversation, or you don't want to get into conversation? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's just. Just comes out. So it's all right to well, lie if you just don't want to get into conversation? <laughs> and then you <laughs> hack and cough. And <laughs> <laughs> what are you supposed to say? It's none of your business? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's, this is the question. I think uh, that's where I think there's a shade of meaning here and there. If you've got something, for, for example, there's a woman going, getting s uh, some treatment for something that is purely feminine. She doesn't need somebody peering down into that and answering, no, I've got such and such and such and such. Yeah. Ditto for men if it comes to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, look at Proverbs 19 now, verse 3. Some people ruin themselves by their own stupid actions and then blame the Lord. Can you think of an example how that might happen? Well, almost anybody that... Well, this would be my perception. Almost anybody that is in a tight spot and they're wondering, you know, where God is and why he hasn't done something. This isn't, well, let me say something about, I'll, I'll pass on that. Okay. Would Saul have come under that? Maybe. He sure had some warning, didn't he, and went against yeah. it. You know, the, ultimately, there's not anything befalls us that it's our fault. Um, well, let me take you a medical example, okay? There was a patient who came in to see his doctor, and he was morbidly obese, very fat, okay? And when the doctor tried to gently convince him that he needed to reform his ways, he said, oh, but doc, obesity just runs in our family. Yeah. And the doc says, you know, the truth is that nobody runs in your family. <laughs> 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 that was good. <laughs> it's true, you hear that. I like that. <laughs> So, that, you know. Or does any other exercise for that matter. <laughs> or for that, exactly. Well, let's think about this for a moment. Are there certain expressions, certain phrases, certain words that just almost automatically tr trigger a bad response? You know, in, on an individual basis? 
No, yeah. Like, are you saying, are there certain things in my life that I'm sensitive about that I... Well, that's a possibility. And the obvious example is that the people of the world, especially the rougher crowd in the world that I sometimes have to deal with, when they, when they start talking about problems like this, it's very easy for them to fall into using swear words. One of the prime ones is, is talking against somebody's mother. That's guaranteed yeah. to get your face rearranged instantly. <laughs> 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 exactly. Well, are we prepared, in light of this discussion, for example, are we really prepared to try to change our ways? You out there, what do you think? Are you prepared to change your ways? I think well, why we should I change them well, right? Uh, You're right, okay. I think if we want to get to heaven, there's a good chance we should. <laughs> Why do people fight over money? Is money ever a source of happiness? Now, we all need money. They're, we need it for our clothing and housing and transportation and food. And, but most of us in our society have a lot more than we basically really need. I mean, I spent many years in Africa where the average mm -hmm. income is about a dollar a day. Boy, you know. Yeah. Are there some things that are worse than poverty? And, and by contrast, why is it that so many rich and famous people who presumably have everything that they could possibly need to be happy, why do they so often end up in divorces? Or ver various kinds of battles in court? So how do I take all these principles that we've discussed here and apply those to the discussion of, about women's ordination in the church? Okay. How are you going to do that? Well, I'm the now one asking the question here. <laughs> That's right. I, um, are, are some of these things that we've discussed, are they going to manifest themselves as we, as we attack this this uh, problem, this, uh, this yeah, this this issue. situation that we this are issue. facing here about gossiping, for example. Am I going to be tempted to say, "Oh, that old bag over there, she's this, that, and the <laughs> other," or that old yes. that old conference president, he's just an old male, this, that, or the other, and so on yes. and so forth. And and what do we do when we get into this? When we we get into a discussion with people that are obviously don't agree with us on certain issues. We try to tear them down because we think by tearing them down it makes our argument sound a little better. Is that a good plan? It just uh, joins Satan's club, doesn't it? Yeah. If we don't watch it. Well, how many of our troubles, to be honest now, how many of our troubles tend to be self-created? Do we take full responsibility for everything we say and do? Are any of us ever tempted to lie or bully? Do we, do we like liars? Do we like bullies? Not usually. Well, for those of us who believe in the great controversy over God's character and government and Satan's attacks on God, it should be clear that the basic problem that leads to fights is selfishness. I mean, look at how it all started. So what, what am I supposed to do with this bully? That's... A bully pulpit with this. Yeah, well, we mentioned women's ordination. Mm -hmm. How am I supposed to respond to that? And they seem to be winning. How they are. <laughs> <laughs> how do how do I? What do we what do we do about that? Well, using these all of these sometimes these think, guidelines here. Sometimes I think we need to refocus. There are other basic areas of salvation I think may be a bit more important than that. But that's just my... Yeah. Um, well, there's one pr approach that I almost guaranteed will work eventually, and that's wait till the next generation comes along. <laughs> but uh, that's well, pretty slow. There's a lot of African Americans in this country that say we've been doing that generation after generation after generation. I th well, I think we've got to make allowances for other, other countries and other 
other customs. We've been too hard-nosed on some of this. Mm -hmm. right. When you analyze it, women supported Christ pretty much during his ministry. Very the much very so. least. But probably Martin Luther King Jr. was the most effective. I mentioned the African-American struggle. Mm -hmm. And look at the tactics that he used, which were mm -hmm. totally peaceful tactics. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would appear to me. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's try to summarize, since we're, we're about to run out of space, time here. Proverbs 17 talks about good words that build relationships, evil words that destroy relationships, and the cause of those evil words. If we go down to chapter 18, it focuses on, it has l little groups of, of two or three uh, uh, verses that, that fit together, and usually the most important one is the one in the middle. Proverbs 19 talks about virtues extolled. What kind of lives do people live that are honest, patient, educated, willing to forgive and have good marriages? Wouldn't that be a recipe for success? In light of what we have read in Proverbs 17 and 19 and studied in this lesson, why is it that there are so many people in our world still acting like fools? Should, I mean, as we grow up, shouldn't we learn how not to be fools? How many people are sacrificing even their lives for wealth, status, and secu security and power? I mean, you wonder, some of these people who blow themselves up, what do they think they're gaining? They're getting a name for themselves. Some, some apparently do these horrific things just to get their names in the news. Well, one day, hopefully not too far in the future, the devil will try to destroy everyone who is on God's side here on this earth by preventing them from buying or selling. Revelation 13, 16 to 18. And God responds in what we call the three angels' messages. So we need to remember Jesus' words, will you gain anything if you win the whole world but lose your life? Of course not. There is nothing you can give to regain your life. So what do you think? Would you rather be rich or happy with a lot of friends? Or do we have to make that choice? Is riches automatically opposed to having friends? I hope not. Our kind and loving Father, we ask that those who listen will be assisted and aided in their understanding of you and of the book of Proverbs by what we've said today. Amen.